I keep waiting for this to get easier. It keeps getting bigger and more complicated. When will things get simpler? So here's the thing. Everything we've done up until this point has allowed us to get to this point. Maybe I do kind of know what I'm doing a little bit. You're doubting me, I can tell. I wasn't nervous because I trusted my skills. One of the things that surprised me most in all these conversations I had was that every single person still has crushing imposter syndrome. The very best piece of professional and personal advice I ever got in my life was exactly that quote, you're not that important. Delore, you have worked with the president in the White House. You've worked with Bill Gates and other cool people like that. I mean, I'm just throwing names out there, but <laughs> every step of your career, it seems like you've been able to go from mountaintop to mountaintop. And so if we can start, why is imposter syndrome something that affects every single ambitious person? Yeah, okay, well, I have a bone to pick with imposter syndrome because even the name alone, like the gall of the name alone, <laughs> imposter syndrome, like you're an imposter, maybe you should leave. You've got a syndrome, perhaps you're sick and you should sit down, like it's bullshit, right? This whole <laughs> idea, like if we have imposter syndrome, there's something wrong with us. When in fact, there's something wrong with all the other people that are out there. there there's something wrong with the systems that were created not to look like us, right? Like you have imposter syndrome because you're the first person who is doing a thing that is in a room where people didn't think you could do the thing. Of course, you're an imposter. Congratulations. You're an imposter, right? So every single one of us is affected by imposter syndrome if we have achieved something that was not expected for us to achieve, whether it was not expected from people from the outside or was not expected by us on the inside. Of course, we're going to have it. And those are the moments where inside your brain, something goes, oh my God, you haven't done this before. When really we should be hearing it as, oh my God, you haven't done this before. Okay, so I've heard you say that and it sounds like slam poetry to me, you know? And I have an issue with slam poetry because when it's really well done, it's well done, yeah. right? It's like porn, right? Like you can define it because you kind of know what it <laughs> exactly. is. Exactly, I know when right? I see it. Yeah. yeah, you know when you see it, that's crossing the line or yeah. whatever it is. Slam poetry is like sometimes, if badly done, it's like, no, we're not in. In we are or something like just the words <laughs> and flip it. So, so t help me understand how we can actually not go like, I've never seen this before. Yeah. Like, oh, I've never seen this before. Like, yeah. how do we flip that? Yeah, I know. Like, so I write personal development books and there's a lot of horse shit in personal development, right? <laughs> like I wrote this book because when I found myself in this moment of, oh my God, I've never done this before. I read every book out there. I learned to 10X. I learned to lean yeah. in. I learned to yeah. stop apologizing. You like, like, you don't like Cardone because of 10X. You don't, I mean, you're not like, a huge fan of Hollis because you made a slight about washing your face. You. you know, I mean, look, I am an entrepreneur. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I have built things. I have been in the trenches. I understand like what people are going through. And I feel like a lot of people in my space are really interested in the slam poetry piece of it, but they don't get the content right. And they're like, how do I get the applause? And it's like, no, how do you get the content right? Because people are actually making decisions in their lives based on what you're saying. So like get the content right. So here's the thing. Everything we've done up until this point has allowed us to get to this point. And I am a firm believer that what got us here won't get us there, but at least it's enough to get us to this place here where we're standing on a very solid foundation of what we've actually experienced, what we actually know. Albert Einstein says that all knowledge is experience. And I really believe like if you haven't actually done something, you don't fully know it. But with all due respect to our pal, Al, if all knowledge is experience and all wisdom is framework. And so when we're here at this point, standing on the foundation of everything that's come before, we have a framework of understanding how to get to where we're going. So in this book, I talked to a hundred different glass ceiling shatterers, Olympic medalists, startup unicorns, and everyday people like us. And here's what I learned. They say things to themselves like, I don't have confidence in the thing that's coming ahead but I figured out a lot of things behind. And because I figured those things out, when I also didn't know what the hell I was doing, that gives me confidence to know that even though I don't know what the hell I'm doing now, I know how to figure things out, right? So this moment when we're like, I haven't done this before. Oh, I haven't done this before. What's exciting about that and how we can change that voice in our head is to rely on facts, right? Like emotion can't argue with facts. So if we are seeing for ourselves all the things we've done up until now, then that gives us data, right? Like you have a list of data of what you've accomplished. That's like, okay, well, maybe I do kind of know what I'm doing a little bit. 
Hmm. I hear you. Uh, like so last night. But for you're example, doubting. No, I can no, tell. no, no. It's not that I'm doubting you. It's just last night I was up in bed because I'm worried about a new product we're launching. We have a new offer. We have a new product. Through COVID, we shrunk our team down. We've made all of these changes. And so I contrast between morning mark. And I was telling my CEO, like, like morning mark is objective. Yeah. Full of potential. Everything is great. And it's like, I know we can do this. During COVID, I've spent way more time with my kids. Yeah. I'm a really kick ass dad right now. And when I lean into sales, I can grow business. And when I pour myself into my team, they feel seen and heard. And I'm a great husband when I'm doing that. Like, and I've realized, like, oh man, I am objectively amazing at anything that I have a passion for and work hard on and spend time. Doing. Yes. Like it maybe doesn't happen as fast as I want, certainly doesn't happen the way that I want. But anything that I actually commit myself to, <laughs> I knock out of the park. And yet, last night I'm up in bed going, like, oh, I'm just a little bit worried about, you know, should I do a shareholder loan into this thing? And what should I do? And what if there's not enough time? And what if I get too busy? And what if I get there and I don't like it? And what if I run out of energy? And what if there's just, I can't find the people? And what if I put my name on the line and then suddenly, you know, I'm standing in front of people and I fail in front of them. Like just all the stuff that happens all yes. the time. And I've been an entrepreneur for 16 years. Yes. So I hear you. I just don't know how to stop it. And maybe the answer is you can't or I don't know. I don't think you can. So one of the things that surprised me most in all these conversations I had was that every single person I talked to, every single one at every age and at every stage still has crushing imposter syndrome and doubt mm. and uncertainty and insecurity and fear and anxiety and all of these things. But if the only way not to have that is if you just do the thing that you just have already done. Like there's no way to not have uncertainty when you're doing something you've never done before, period. End of paragraph, end of story, right? That's it. Like you can't actually get rid of that voice. But what you can do is you can hear that voice, not as this like, these slings and arrows that we have to like swallow down and push and, you know, ignore. Like I look at those and I say, okay, well, the fact that you're having all of those questions and concerns, that tells me that you're like nine toes over the edge of incompetency. Like you're almost all the way to the thing you haven't done before. So how cool is that? Like that's, they're actually helpful allies to tell you that you're on the right track. So yeah, they still suck and they're still hard to have, but you can do things to mitigate you know, the risk, right? So you can put the biggest ass kicker, you know, in your sidecar who doesn't let you settle for mediocrity and check in with that person on a daily or a weekly basis, right? That helps you to know that you're going to get past the line. You can rehearse what you're doing with enough people so that you know it. Like when Michael Jordan was going for the three-peat for the Chicago Bulls, they asked him, I don't know if you watched the documentary that The Last oh, Dance. Oh, The Last Dance. I used to actually put it on just on the screen on silent while I was doing my workouts. I watched it while I was on the rowing machine. Same because I was thing. like, I just need to be, I just need to see these guys yes. in the sweat. I just need to be around them. So <laughs> this is what I thought was the most fascinating about it. They said to him, were you nervous? Like everybody in the city of Chicago, everybody in the United States, everybody in the world is watching you, seeing if you could do the impossible. Were you nervous? And he's like, no, I wasn't nervous because I trusted my skills. I trusted my practice. I trusted what I did. I trusted the work. And I talked to these Olympic medalists and I was like, what do you do when you're like at the top of the hill, standing in the blocks and you're ready to go? What are you thinking about? And every one of them was like, nothing, nothing. Like we earned our medals in practice. We're just picking them up on race day. So like you're having all of these, you know, Evening Mark is not listening to morning Mark, but evening Mark could rest knowing that like, okay, I have this worry. What am I going to do? I have that worry. What am I going to do? I have this worry. What have I already done? There's a great guy um, named Safi Bacall who wrote a book called Loon Shots, which is absolutely phenomenal book. And I heard him on a podcast with Tim Ferriss where he was talking about insomnia and how he cured his insomnia. And what he did is he said he got his, I think it, it, he called it like his itty bitty shitty committee. And he got them like <laughs> in his brain. Actually, that might be a Leanne Davey thing. The itty bitty shitty committee in his brain. He was like, okay, brain, you're worried about the investor report. Just like sit at the table. Tell me you're worried. Okay. 
I'm going to send that report out tomorrow morning. Is that good? Okay, next. Worry about, you know, my relationship. My wife is concerned that we haven't planned our anniversary trip yet. Okay, I'm going to put that on my calendar tomorrow for three o'clock to reach out to the travel agent. And he would just like go around in his brain, like in like a, he would imagine a like a board meeting and go around and he'd be like, okay, are you all satisfied? Have I talked to all of you? Great. Anybody got any more concerns? And like, so he literally would go through this exercise in his brain where he would create the like, I'm going to sit you all down. And once I've talked to you and I've heard all your complaints and you know, I've written it down on my phone. I've made a note. Like I know it's all settled. I can now rest. So I don't know, oh, maybe evening Mark needs I, to I like, like have a board I meeting. I like that. I got to remember that. I had Julia Cameron on the podcast a while back. She's the author of The Artist's yeah, Way. Morning Pages. Um, morning Pages. you know, And she says that she has a critic in her head that she's named Nigel. And he speaks with a British accent kind of thing. And she's like, of course she would have a, of course she would have a sophisticated <laughs> voice in her head. My voice in my head talks. He's like from the Bronx, but hers is from, you know, <laughs> went to Eaton. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's always like, okay, I hear you, Nigel. Yeah, I got you. Thank you. Thank you. We can't ignore the voice. The voice is going to be yeah. there. And I think, you know, I was having a conversation with another a writer friend of mine, Rahaf Harfouche, who wrote Hustle and Float. And she's just absolutely a brilliant human being. And she was talking about how to try to, you know, quiet that voice because she thinks it's getting in her way of actually creating. And I said, I actually hear that voice. And I think it's actually pretty good because if I wasn't a student of this work, if I wasn't, if I didn't look at other writers, if I didn't look at other authors, other speakers, other thought leaders and say, that's how to do it excellently then I would just be settling for only what I could see. And so the fact that you're seeing other entrepreneurs around you and you're seeing what they're doing, it's like you have the curse of knowledge, right? Like, you know what excellent you, can be. You know be. what good is. And you so know what you good know, is right. and you know that you are not, right? Exactly, exactly. Glass talks about that. Exactly. Ira. So I, if you really want to hear me curse, I've got a great story. <laughs> I can tell you about when my last book, Limitless, came out. I had what I thought was like the final manuscript and I was sending it off to my publisher and I called this woman, Carrie Lorenz, who is the first female F-14 fighter pilot in the U.S. Navy. She stands on stage, six foot tall, leather from head to toe. She won the head of the Charles in college as a collegiate rower. And the only reason she left pre-Olympic training was to go to officer candidate flight school. Like that's badass. Total badass. Total badass. badass. She's also married happily for children. Like she's just crushing it in every part of her life. So I meet her at dinner one night. I didn't know her. I met her. We sat at a dinner table together and I called her the next day and I was like, would you ever maybe consider possibly even remotely pondering blurbing my book? She was like, yeah, you're a badass woman. I'm a badass woman. I want to support badass women. And I was like, great. Send her the manuscript. She calls me three days later and I think I'm going to get praise. Not get free. I did not get praise. Did she, did she call you out? Did she say you could do better? This is a direct quote. Laura, you're really fucking smart. And this book is really fucking good but you're too fucking smart for this book just to be really fucking good. You need to make it really fucking great. And then I'll blur oh. the shit out of it. Wow. And then she spent, and then my answer was like, I know, like I knew I got like 95% of the way there and I just couldn't figure out how to like do the thing because I just, I didn't know I hadn't been writing long enough. I just, I didn't have enough experience. And I was like, I know, like, I just didn't know what was wrong. And she's like, well, let me tell you what's wrong. And she helped me. She spent 45 minutes on the phone with me, not only helping me figure out exactly what was wrong, but then introducing me to her editor, who I worked with on Limitless, and then again on Wonder Hell to make it really fucking great. And that book debuted as a Washington Post bestseller right behind Michelle Obama. I was on the Today Show, Good Morning America, all the things. And I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been if she didn't step in. So, you know... I keep thinking about evening Mark and I'm like, this evening Mark is surrounded by people who are worthy of morning Mark. Then I don't know that you need to worry as much about some of those things, but it's just a question yeah. of what do you have around you that's mitigating the risk? So it's not just you and your worries. Well, you know what? So for me, it's a fine line and I've realized I've done this for the last five years, like you, I, for all of our audio listeners, there's a whole lot of books. Yes. Behind Laura. I have just like, Hundreds of books over there too. Yes. And, uh, and the more that I've dug into this, more I've realized that I've just naturally had this... I have ambition. And I, we can talk about ambition. And I only came to terms with that a year ago, realizing that the reason my wife fell in love with me was because I was ambitious. The reason mm. that my team backed me was because I was ambitious. The reason why my, uh, my clients would want to work with me was because I was ambitious on their behalf. And they trusted that my ambition would lead to their success. 
And then somewhere along the way, I internalized ambition as greedy and evil and bad yes. and wrong and all of this stuff. And so I had to work through that. And uh, most more recently, I've realized like, what it comes down to is self-esteem. And it's like, I have this ambition and I have this confidence and I enjoy a lot of things. But you could look at people and get inspired or you can look at them and go like, oh man, that you just see the gap between where they are and where you're not. Yes. You can look at all of your weaknesses and I am an expert on my weaknesses. And yet it was only a few years ago when someone said, well, do you not see how what you deem as weaknesses have actually served you in other areas of your life as strengths? Uh huh. And I realized, okay, everyone says your strengths are your weaknesses. But that means your weaknesses are also your strengths. And if I'm so good at noticing all my weaknesses, what other areas of my life have they been serving me? And so I'm trying to get better at these things. But a few things that have really hurt, like held me up is like the thought of, oh man, it never gets easier. I'm just like, I keep waiting for this to get easier. This, you know, no one is going to figure this out for me. Oh man, I'm just so tired of it always being on my shoulders all the time. Yeah, it just keeps getting bigger and more complicated. When will things get simpler? <laughs> yeah. And so that's the okay. nighttime mark. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, that was the big moment for me writing Wonder Hell because, you know, so the book debuts, right? I have all this graph. I thought three people yeah. would buy my last book, literally. Like Limitless. my mother, my father. Now, and I actually have to say, sorry to interrupt your story. I saw you speak live in Inbound 2019, <laughs> right before COVID. Oh, I was terrible. <laughs> You spoke. It was <laughs> terrible so? there. I just sprained my ankle. I was giving this talk about this, you know, like it was just a really dry, horrible talk. Oh God, I'm sorry. I remember the energy in the room being like, it was like day three. It was day three. It was morning time. And I didn't, I thought an earthquake was happening, but that's only because we were in a convention center yes. where if trucks went by, the whole ground would shake. And I remember going onto Twitter I remember going on Twitter during your keynote and being like, is there an earthquake happening right now in Boston? Because <laughs> and... Laura is definitely not shaking the room. This is definitely not <laughs> no, but I remembered your speech and I followed you online and I think we DM'd each other a little bit and I've just, I've been following you for years now. So I do have to say, like, you know, you're about to get into the breaking point maybe, but uh, for all of our listeners, like, as far as book launches go, as far as people who want to be an author, who want to be a speaker, who want to travel the world, who want to be on the stages, like, you were on every stage. You put in the time. I put in the time. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't get paid for inbound either, but it's down the street for me. So I was like, all right, I might as well give this a shot. And so the inbound is actually kind of a funny story because when Limitless came out, I put out this assessment online, Limitless Assessment, right? Limitlessassessment.com. And it had like 67 questions. And by the way, nobody's going to take a 67 question assessment. I learned that the hard way. I was like, it's everybody's favorite topic of conversation themselves. Of course, they're going to want to figure this out. No. So in Limitless, I talk about the four things people need in order to find both happiness, you know, success and happiness. I should have had four questions, one around each of the four things, but no. Everybody's too busy trying to figure out which Harry Potter house they're in. <laughs> really? So I was like, all right, fine. So now there's like a four question quiz that people can take. But I put this assessment out and then I did Good Morning America, did all this crazy TV. And I went and I looked at the assessment and there were like, I don't know, 400 responses 400 and i was like all right well that stinks Twenty five thousand people started it 400 finished it that tells you just how you know tired and busy and lazy people are however when i was toying with this idea of like how do i do a talk around the limitless leader like how do we take the things that keep us both successful and happy and then apply it to our people because i spent 20 years in executive search my job was to call the most successful people in the world and recruit them away and despite all this success they weren't very happy so they called me back so i was like well leaders can figure out how to do this with their people so I didn't really do much with it. I figured I was like trying this thing out. I wasn't really energized about the talk. It wasn't really a very good talk. I had sprained my ankle, as I mentioned the day before. I left there, I texted a friend and I'm like, well, definitely not gonna write The Limitless Leader as my next book because I don't know who was more bored about that talk, me or my people in the audience. So it wasn't <laughs> Well, great. I was there. It wasn't great. I mean, I'm glad that you, you know, like liked it enough to follow me and invite me onto your show because whew, now I get on stage and I'm like moxie driven and I'm just like, Cocktail party, Laura, but that was like business school, Laura, and it was definitely not my jam. But I will say, coming out of the pandemic, I heard this blowhard dude, thought leader, biz coach type talking about what's driving the great resignation. And he was like, well, we just need to, leaders need to pay their people more. 
And I was like, well, yeah, if you're not paying a living wage, but that doesn't comport with 20 years of executive search. And what I saw were the things that actually compelled people to talk to me and want to leave a job. I was like, I, wonder, God, I just wish there was data around this. I had 20 years of anecdotal information. I wish there was data. And I was like, huh, I wonder if anyone ever took that assessment. And so I went and I opened the assessment back up and there were 6,000 responses from 74 oh. different countries from January, 2019 all the way to present. So before, during, and after the pandemic. And I'm like, there is probably not another body of research like this. So then I spent nine months teaching myself how to do pivot tables in Excel. <laughs> oh, you should have called Jonah Berger up. You should have just been like, dude. <laughs> I probably should have called him. I could, should have called uh, Jason. I, there were just so many people that I could have called. But no, I went to computer sleepaway camp when I was 13 years old. And I was like, I can do this. Yeah. Narrator. She is, could not do this. It was very hard, but I figured it out. I ended up writing an HBR article about it. And then I just ignored it again because it's interesting to me what's driving the great resignation. What's more interesting to me is the fact that internal candidates, when they apply for a job and they interview for the job, always end up leaving because it's that moment of potential that they see, right? They're like, Interviewing for the job means that they have to wear the clothes of that role and answer questions in that role and, and speak in the voice of that role. And all of us, when we see that potential future us, just we can't unsee it. And I'm more fascinated by how we can achieve and unlock what's inside of us than how like leaders can help like keep their people happy. Yeah. There's yeah. a much better business argument to do the limitless leader. I could probably get paid a bajillion dollars to like <laughs> give it to like Verizon and be like, take care of your 65,000 people, take it. And in five minutes, I'll tell you exactly which manager sucks. If the people who will budget that want that kind of information. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. Sometimes in corporations, you know, I remember hearing this a long time ago, right? That, that all facts, all truth is good. You know, like it's just none of it is bad. None of it is evil. None yeah. of it. You should, but some people aren't comfortable facing that. It's interesting what you, what you would just mentioned, though, about like when you see yourself and taste it and feel it, you sparked a, a memory of something that Gary Vee, I once heard him say, there's the moment of internal truth. And then there's the moment where your head finally catches up. So, so like in a relationship, friends can know when a relationship is over long before the relationship's over because the people in their hearts kind of give up on stuff. Yes. But, but they're in their heads, they're still like working away on it. Mm -hmm. and people stay in a role or in a company or in a job that frankly is just like they're not lit up for. Yeah. And then as soon as they decide, they're like, you know what, I think I might try this side, even though they give themselves like a year to quit or something. Like they have checked out the moment yes. <laughs> that their heart has gone there. And so I just tried to remember, like I've noticed this in my own life. Yeah. Close that gap. Like close the gap between when emotionally you've like felt something, you've wanted something, you've lived in that dream or yeah. you've made the decision, like frankly, to give up on something. Close that gap. Yes. Well, I love the poster behind you. Think big, be bold, <laughs> say yes. Right. I think there may be like a different time frame between when we're running away from something or we're running towards something. Right. So a lot of times we're running away from something and we want to get out of there as fast as we can because we know it's not right, even though we don't know what's coming. And I think our comfort of moving or maybe our discomfort of staying is more louder in those moments. But if we're running towards something, we just have this little bit of drag sometimes, because like you're saying, you have this like, what if I'm giving a presentation and I fail? Like, what if I, you know, don't get the investor thing right? Like there's all this, you know, it's right there. But we sometimes we put roadblocks in our own way. Because we're afraid that if we go there too fast, we're not going to get there. People are going to see it. We're going to fail. It's going to be embarrassing. The truth is nobody's actually watching us. Like nobody cares. I mean, I hope people are watching this. You're, but like, You're not that important, right? Not, well, the very, did I, the very best piece of professional and personal advice I ever got in my life was exactly that quote. You're not that important. Share this story for our audience because <laughs> yeah, sure. I feel like it's just, it's a really important lesson we all have to remember, especially for those of us who are ambitious, mm -hmm. those of us who bet on ourselves. Yeah. You have to have a certain amount of confidence, a certain amount of, I guess confidence is the word because you're going to, you're going to go ahead and do what other people aren't comfortable doing. Yes. And so you think at a certain level, you think you're good and you think you're important. And yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, okay, so I do want to talk about ambition at one point and it being a dirty word. So I do want to get back to that. But I'll tell two very quick stories. And the first is about confidence, right? The confidence. When I was first running my executive search firm and I was trying to sell organizations on this brand new, very different, sort of unpacked, bespoke way of doing executive search, 
I would walk into my potential clients and I would tell them about this very complex thing that we were doing. And executive search is like recruiting, right? It's like like recruiting, you're a headhunter, right? so, you would go find people, they pay yes. you to, to go find the executive or yes. something. And typically okay. you get paid one third of the first year's cash compensation for any executive that you placed. Now, if I'm doing a search for a CEO of a company that's making $300,000, I'm getting paid a hundred grand for that. Right. If I'm getting paid and say I'm doing like the chief strategy officer for the Kellogg Foundation, three hundred thousand dollars, I'm getting paid a hundred grand. If I'm doing the executive director of a local domestic violence shelter, they're maybe paying that person 60. So I'm getting a twenty thousand dollar fee. Who do you think my boss wants me to pay more attention to? Right. Obviously, the bigger one. Who do you think has an easier time recruiting people and it doesn't miss the money as much? The bigger one. And it just didn't feel right to me. It wasn't why I got into the work in the first place. I wanted to help my clients solve problems. What I realized was that I was part of their problem because they were worrying so much about the money and they couldn't spend the time. And we also weren't leaving them with capacity in house. So I came up with this entire different way to do the work. And I walked into my boss's office one day and I was like, there's a better way. And he was like, there's the door. You can stay. You, you literally had, I did, a, I had a Jerry uh, Maguire moment. A Jerry Maguire moment. Like. <laughs> Absolutely. And he basically was like, look, we love you. We think you're great. We'd love for you to stay, but you're going to do it our way if you stay. And in that moment, I was like, well, if I'm not the solution for my clients, I'm the problem for my clients. And that didn't work for me. So it was like, I had my manifesto and I had my, if I had a fish, I would have taken the fish out. It was total Jerry Maguire. And I started my own firm. And then I spent five years trying to sell work on behalf of this firm. And I sold some, right? But I didn't sell all the work that I thought I should. And I walked into a pitch once and I fucking crushed it. I crushed it. And I left. And the next day, my friend who was on the search committee, the decision committee called me up and he's like, yeah, sorry, man. We, we went with someone else. And I was like, what do you mean? Like I crushed it. And he goes, Laura, do you find the world's best talent? And I said, of course we do. That's table stakes. And he's like, yeah, never say it. Every other firm walks in and says, we find the world's best talent. Now let us tell you how. And you went right to the how. So we were like, got lost in your process. And all we knew is that we were solving your problem of proving that your business model worked and you weren't solving our problem. So this thing about confidence, I learned that I had to go in and talk about the work that we did with so much confidence. That confidence was contagious to my clients, right? Like you're talking about having ambition and knowing that you're really good at what you're doing. I don't think ambitious is a dirty word. I think it's really important. Like if you're going to go and sell something to somebody and take their money for that thing, you better know that you're going to be good at delivering it. And if you're going to be good at delivering it, you need to tell them because the next person in the door ain't going to do it for you, right? So I had to learn to walk in and say, we find the world's best talent. Now, let me tell you how we do it differently than every other schmuck who's going to walk in here. And we sold everything that I pitched, right? Ah. For the next 15 years, we were like, had like a 95% hit rate because I had so much confidence, so much contagious confidence backed up by a track record of actually being able to do it. So it's not just ambition as much as it's, I see the world in a certain way. I want the world to be better, to be different. And I know that I have a lever that I can pull to make it so. It's not my ambition to do it. It's my responsibility to do it. And because I know that I know how to pull that lever better than most people out there, I'm not going to hide that. I'm not going to yeah. hide that. I will apologize when I mess up, but I'm also going to tell you how good I am when I'm hitting on all cylinders. I, I love that. that. And I, <laughs> you know, I, I remember I started my firm in 2006. And in, I think it was 2005 or 2006, I was at a conference, in an internet marketing conference. And I remember Max Callis, who later became a friend. I ended up starting my company, subletting off of his office and all this stuff. But before I even met him, he was speaking on stage. Was he better than me at Inbound? I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I just... I remember this story. He said that he was at a networking event. Now, this is very old. Maybe it's old school. Maybe people still do this. It was like at a BNI event or something, like a networking event, a chamber event. And there was one of his competitors there, and he's in internet marketing. So I guess what are they talking about? You know, at the time, SEO, mm -hmm. PC, the websites, landing pages. And the person went on and on, and he's watching a uh, woman who does not know anything about this. Her eyes glazes yeah. over as this techie person across is just going on and on about all the great stuff that they do. And at the end, she just goes, "I just want a pretty website." <laughs> exactly. And then. And then the person got dejected and walked away. And Max was watching the whole time. He just took out his card. He just said, just so you know, we make pretty websites. Here you go. <laughs> and then that was it. He just left. And that always stuck Mike with me. Drop, because, right? <laughs> in, in the conference, everyone 
I mean, it was a moment of like, oh, Max, you did it. Yep. <laughs> yep. And my friend Clay A. Bear likes to say, nobody buys 15 minutes abdominal exercises that work every piece of your core. They buy six pack abs. Like you need to sell the solution not the process. And I was like, oh, I wish I knew you 15 years ago. <laughs> I was trying to sell the process. Nobody cares about the process. They just want to know that you see their problem, you understand their problem, and you're going to carry that problem in your hands until the problem goes away. That's it. That's yeah. all they care about. And then yeah. they want to know the price, but they don't like, you can't even sell the price until they understand the value. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Wonder Health, but before yeah. we do, you said that there were a few things you wanted to circle around on. If I mean, you just mentioned ambition, yeah. but can we talk about ambition? Because it might be cultural. I think it especially affects women, the women in my life, the women that I've had on the podcast that I've spoken to. But if you're of a religious upbringing, if you have any kind of modesty, if you have like, I didn't even realize that it, my German upbringing... Germans, I guess, don't like they want to be the smartest, but you can't appear to be the smartest. Yes. You want to have wealth, but you can't appear to flaunt wealth. Yes. You want to succeed, but you can't be appear to be trying, right? It's just not. And I didn't even realize that this very German upbringing instilled in me this like, I want to be the best. Oh, but I can't be seen being the best or even try to be the best. So it's like ambition is this thing that I don't know if we talk about. Yeah. And I think that ambition has just gotten this really bad rap, right? Like, oh, she's so ambitious. Like nobody says, oh, he's so ambitious. Or, like he's a go-getter, right? Like buy the steak, Mr. Big. Great. Like with the women, it's like, maybe don't get the latte and the avocado toast. And even if you think about how we talk to women about money, about investing, like men should make big plays and women should clip coupons, right? It's just the way that we even just think about it and how we're trained from a very early age is very much like don't upset the apple card and don't you know make anybody crazy and it's good to be nice i think being nice is bullshit like we should be nice to each other we should be friendly we should be warm but there's this this, this idea that you know as as long as you're not hurting anybody and getting in anybody's way like it's okay if you want big things and i think we're hurting more people and getting in more people's way by not bringing our gifts into the world in a way that we can really serve other people i mean seth godin says like if you had a gift if you have a thing and you're not putting it out into the world you're actually stealing from people like you're stealing from them and i'm like yeah that's actually pretty true but I don't think ambition is bad because here's the thing. If you had more money, more time, more leverage, more resources, more power, more network, more whatever, wouldn't you be able to show up more for the people you loved and the causes you hold dear and the company you're just trying to build? Absolutely you would. So it's not your ambition. It's, it is your responsibility. It's your responsibility to those people, to the company. I mean, you being ambitious I don't know that your wife fell in love with you because you were ambitious. I don't know that your investors invested because you're ambitious. They invested in you because you had contagious confidence about the thing you wanted to build. They invested with you because you saw a world in a way where things could be different and understood your lever to do that. And you had confidence in that lever, right? I don't know that it's ambition, right? It's not, maybe they fall in love with you and wanted to invest in you because you were hungry and they could see that you're willing to do the work. But it was the contagious confidence that made them say, yeah, I'm going to get in the car and ride with him, right? Like, mm. it's not just the ambition. And I, I definitely have seen this over the course of probably now 30 years of giving people like career coaching advice. There are people who come to me all the time, but they're like big, hairy, you know, audacious goals. And they tell me about all the stuff they're going to do. And I'm like, uh-huh, like, they're not going to do any of that shit. And then somebody comes to me and they tell me about a dream that they have, a goal that is so big and so scary and so venerated in their own hearts that they barely whisper it when they talk about it. And you can see the twinkle in their eye and you're like, you know that it is inside of them in this way that they cannot get rid of it. And they will need to get up in the morning, in the dark, do the work that nobody sees in order to make it happen. Those are the ones that I know. They may be completely clueless about to get from A to Z. They may be completely clueless about to get from A to B but I know that they're willing to do it. And so I would probably say that it wasn't the ambition. It's that it's the hunger and the desire, the confidence that you have in it to do it. That probably was the thing. And I think we should all be ambitious. I think we should absolutely be ambitious because why not? Like what's the alternative? Like what's the opposite of ambitious? 
mediocrity. Like nobody lights a light and then puts a bushel over it. You know, what we, I don't know. There's some Bible verse about that, but <laughs> like light your light, basically let it shine. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But so here's the other side. So you wanted me to tell the story about the, that you're not that important. And this is a good, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, this is a good opposite to it. So I was super ambitious, super ambitious about everything in my life. Like my kids, my family, my community, all the things. And then I sat down with this woman who she's this older woman. She's from, you know, Queens and she had just sold her company for like $60 million. And this is like 25 years ago. So, you know, it was a lot of money back then. Still a lot of money, but it was a lot of money back then. And I was telling her about like, you know, it's just so hard. I don't really know. And she's like, I don't understand. You've got a happy marriage, healthy kids. Your business is thriving. What's the problem? And I was like, I don't know. I just yell at my kids too much. And she's like, well, tell me about a typical day. So I was like, well, I get up in the morning and I work out and I like get my body in shape and I never take my kids to school because that's like garbage time. They're like in a rush and they're cranky and they're like shoving food in their face. It's garbage time. So we have a nanny. The nanny takes the kids to school. Great. I come home. I do all my work for my clients I, with all of my people. I deal with my with management and financials and marketing, all the stuff I have to do. And then I pick up my kids because like that's really good time, like windshield time. And I try to do it like three days a week if I can, four if I'm lucky, but never five. Because like a cameo appearance is always more valued than a starring role, right? So like I'm picking up my kids and then we go to the, then we go to the, uh, the park and I hold up my phone, which I think was like a palm trio at the time. And I'm like, but then it's amazing because the value of technology, like I can be with my clients, but I, even though I'm at the park and it's great. And then we go home and I like, you know, put them, you know, they, they do their homework and then, you know, I go back to work and then we make dinner and she was just like, wait, wait. When do you relax? When do they relax? Like, when do they watch TV? When do you like go for ice cream? And I was like, ice cream, ice cream with sugar. It's terrible. And TV, all that rots their brain. Meanwhile, I find out later that like her daughter is the head of children's programming at like Sesame Street or something. So like, (laughs) okay, Laura, do your homework when you're asking for a mentoring conversation. Lesson learned. And she looks at me and she's like, okay, you're not that important. I was like, what do you mean? Like, I'm building my business. I'm building my family. I'm on these boards. Like, of course I'm that important. She's like, no, you're not. She's like, if you are building a business that can't withstand you putting your phone in the trunk for an hour while you take your kids to the park, either you're a micromanager or nobody on your team cares enough about that business to keep it running in your absence. And both of those things are problems. She's like, you are not that important. She's like, if you cannot be gone, if you can't spend time with your kids, if you can't have different parts of your life at different times, she's like, when I was running my business, I had rules. Like I would always go back to work after seven o'clock, but I had dinner with my kids every night. I never flew anywhere that I had to take two flights because if it was two flights, it was a secondary media market and I was more important than that. And I was like, okay. She's like, what she said to me wasn't, you're not that important. It was, you're not that important for all of these things all the time. And you need to figure out where the hell you are that important and double down there. So like, you don't need to be in every single weekly meeting about bookkeeping. You need to take your kids for ice cream once a week and just look at them and be present without a screen in between you. And that fundamentally changed the way that I showed up in my life, in my work, in my marriage, and in my community. That is like such a great lesson for us all. But actually, what I'm most struck by is this is now in in the conversation we've had in the last 45 minutes, the second woman who has basically bitch slapped you into like waking up. Like, yeah, is this I get a common my ass thing? kicked by a lot of women. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like my friend Evan Carmichael, you know, we've known each other for a long time. He will send me the most uncomfortably direct emails. I can go back <laughs> to like 2012 at three in the morning and it always meant something to me because like, oh, you're thinking of me in the middle of the night, but usually he was kicking the shit out of me. Yeah. And there's nothing like a good ass it, kicking. But he kept doing it because I kept getting up. Yeah. And the I realized there was a moment where I kind of gave up so much that he just like kind of stopped. He's like, well, okay. But uh, something I think I'm seeing in you and I see it in me and I see it in other ambitious people, other leaders, other successful people, this like, I'd rather you tell me the uncomfortable truth so at yes. least I know about it. Yes. Then hide. Well, here's the thing. Like if you're just fucking up left and right and nobody's telling you, it's not that people aren't noticing and talking about it. They're just not telling you. So it's already being discussed. I'd rather hear it. It's good to know about Evan because I think I'm doing an Instagram live with him like during launch week or something. So I, okay. <laughs> that's good to know. But you I know, shot his first YouTube video. Oh, Me. wow. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. So here's the thing. Like I would be more worried about when somebody who is invested in me goes silent, right? Like when somebody just becomes disinterested, like I would rather have the full brunt of their emotion 
then have them not even considering me, right? It's like the disinterest is, I don't know. That's like, I feel like that's when you really have let someone down. This idea of like what you said, like maybe I just didn't get up and, you know, I, I didn't work and he gave up. And that cuts me so deep because there are people in my life who I've given up on. And it's because at the end of the day, I can't want it more than them. I can't want it more than them. And I do a lot of executive coaching. And with my executive coaching clients, I have to be really good at listening to what they're saying and what they're not saying to understand if they really want it or if that goal was just handed to them by somebody else at some point in their lives. Because we can't be insatiably hungry for somebody else's goal. But so many people are like, I need to keep going, keep going and doing the thing because somebody else told me I should. And I'm like, yeah, but do you really want to do the thing? And if you don't, like you're not going to do the work in the dark that nobody sees. So I think it's, I think it's really important. I did get my ass kicked once by a guy also. I've had like these sort of three, as I'm thinking about it, I've had these sort of three very, well, there been there was actually one other woman too who helped me get my job in the White House. We should talk about, but there was a guy who I he was a business coach and I sat down with him and I brought him like all of my fancy stuff, like the PL and marketing prospectus and like all the things that I needed. And I was so proud of all of these things. And I was gonna get his advice about like how to scale my business. And he took all the stuff and he like pushed it across the table. And this guy, like, like he was Jack Welch's business coach, GE, like he was like a legit dude. And he was only meeting me for breakfast as like a favor to a friend. Right. So I was like, I can't afford you, but like, I'm going to take advantage of this breakfast. Pushes everything aside. And he's like, Laura, how do you pay yourself? And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, how do you pay yourself? And I said, well, you know, I mean, I like, we bring the money in and then I pay my people and then we reinvest in like databases and pretty websites and things like that. And then we put some money away for a rainy day and I pay myself what's left over. And he was like, you got to stop thinking like such a girl. I was like, wait, what? Ouch, what? And he was like, no, he's like, what kind of life do you want to live? How often do you want to go on vacation? And when you go on those vacations, are you staying at the Four Seasons or the Motel Six? Like no shade to the Motel Six, but like I'm kind of a princess, right? And do you want to be, you know, involved in your community? Are you doing that by doing park cleanups or are you doing that by donating $10,000, right? To help build a park. Like what are the things that you want? How do you want to be home with your kids every day? What kind of car do you want to drive? Like what are, what does your life look like? And then what does that life cost? And when you figure out what that life costs, how do you build a business that throws off that amount of money for you? And that was like 180 degrees difference from the way that I was thinking about being an entrepreneur. I was thinking about being an entrepreneur as you do something good, people come to you and ask you to do more of it. So then you keep doing more of it. And as you keep doing more of it, you build a structure that allows you to do more and more. Until one day I was like, wait, I don't want to do more of it. I don't want to necessarily maximize profits right now, while my kids are little, I want to maximize impact in the world and personal freedom and flexibility that I have to be with my family. And as that grows, I can decide to maximize profit later. And by the way, it turns out I learned that if you maximize two of the three profits, personal flexibility or impact, the third always comes, but you just have to decide which two of the three that you want to bet on for, you know, a period of time. And to be able to do something where I was like, oh, okay, I can now make business decisions based on we're not chasing money. I'm not going to say, I'm going to go do this work for this client that I hate because success in that means just more clients like that I hate, right? I can make decisions to do things differently based on what it is that I personally want. So how do you give people permission to be that honest and direct with you? Well, I call people on their bullshit a lot. I'm really good at figuring out when somebody's lying. I spent, as I mentioned, 20 years interviewing people. So you get pretty good at like seeing the body language, hearing what they say, the change in their voice, the change in where they're looking, you know, on a screen or a conversation. And I call people on their bullshit, but mostly I just keep asking them questions. Like, and what will that lead to? And why do you want that? And what does that look like if you get it? And how do you define success? And how does that get you closer to it? And if you keep prying and peeling away, scratching, right, at that thing, you can tell that they've either not thought about it, which means that that's not really internalized, or they kind of lose steam on it, or they start telling you other things that are interesting. And you sort of go, well, how do we get closer to that? And so I think if you just keep asking questions, people eventually run out of answers. On the coaching side, but I'm curious how the leader who has to be confident, who has to show up, who shows up with all of the, you know, your documents ready, like, 
we have this really weird thing where like we're told to be vulnerable and I'm totally comfortable being vulnerable. I answer it. I mean, it, it gets me in a lot of trouble. I answer any question people will throw at me. Yes. And so I don't mind doing that. But I also know that I have to hold this confidence and I have to hold this vision and I have to like, so you're going to walk into a situation where often we're so guarded and we're wearing our hero suit that either we just intimidate or impress people and they think we got it figured out when we don't. So how do we break that barrier to like it, these women, these men who have like talked honestly with you? What have you been able to do to get in that situation where these powerful people have been able to give you this very direct, honest feedback? How are you showing up? What are you doing? How are you getting... Oh. On when I'm on the other side in order to get it. I think there's a lot of power in just asking questions and saying that you don't know. I walked into that first meeting with that business coach. Like I was walking in to impress him. I was absolutely walking to impress him. And when he slid everything across the table and was just like, yeah, no, I had two choices. I could either argue back and continue to try to impress him. Or I could understand that my role in that moment was not to be the teacher, but to be the student. And my response was like, you know, stop paying yourself up thinking like such a girl. And I was, I just looked at him and I was like, okay, well, how would, how should I be thinking? And then I just let him tell me. I mean, people who want to give you advice, they often want to tell you the thing they want to tell you sometimes more than you actually need to hear it, right? A lot of people, Michael Bungay Stainer has this thing, the advice monster where he like, people rush right into telling you what you should know. Sometimes it's what you should know and sometimes it's not. So asking a lot of questions of them and helping get them to like, well, if you were in this situation and being vulnerable, I know that in those moments, the people who are there to, tell me all the stories about the mistakes that they made and the successes that they've had. And if I can take those, sometimes I learn a lot in those moments. And sometimes I learn a lot in those moments that I don't even realize I learned until 10 years later when something presents itself to me. And then I'm like, oh, uh, that's what he was talking about <laughs> back then, right? Like, I get it. Like that same business coach, I remember talking to him saying like, we brought all of our people together. Our business was completely virtual. We founded it in 2002. So it was like virtual before it was COVID cool. And we'd bring everybody together for a retreat. And I remember calling him one day, I was driving home from the retreat and I was like, that sucked so bad. That sucked so bad. I got in and I gave my state of the union and I told everybody where we were going and what we were doing. And they were like, again, eyes glazed over. And he was like, yeah, because they don't care. You told them all the things that were exciting to you. They don't care. You were talking about how the business was going to grow and how you were going to start to launch these new service offerings. And all they were thinking was, how is this going to affect my job? How is this going to affect my paycheck? And I could have in that moment said, like, no, no, the stuff I was telling was super exciting. Or I could have just stopped and been like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And years later now, when I do executive coaching and I talk to these CEOs, they say the same thing to me. And I'm like, oh, that's what he was saying. I got it. <laughs> that's the advice. <laughs> Oh, that's so good. Okay, so I've got to ask you yeah. about Wonder Hell. Yeah. Now, you said that most books in your space are horse shit. So <laughs> what makes your book not horse shit? <laughs> well, I think my book is not horse shit because I talk to a hundred different people who have been through this and I tell their stories and combine it with my own experience of going through some of these things. And also, I just, I don't know, there's just like a lot of platitudes in the space. I want to print t-shirts that say, before you tell me what to do, show me what you've done. And on the back of it, it's like, uh, hashtag, give me the PL, right? I'm like, it just, there's so <laughs> many people who are like guiding the path who have never walked down the path. And so, listen, like, no shade to Cardone or Hollis or any of those people. Like, I, they're way more successful than I am. They've done great things. But I just, there are a lot of people in the space who haven't and who are still getting up with the same amount of confidence, talking the same, you know, smack on stage and people are making decisions. I had somebody come up to me once in a book signing line and was like, I read the first half of your book and I quit my job. And I wanted to be like, read the second half. Like, I don't know if that's the right decision for you or not. Maybe it is, but I don't know. And I, you know, that's what keeps me up at night, right? The people who are like changing things based on what I say, like, I better get it right. Yeah. So what is Wonder Hell? So Wonder Hell is that moment where you have experienced a little bit of success. It could be huge success. Maybe you sold your first business. It could be small success. Maybe you sold your first tube of lipstick, right? Like whatever it is. Like Put out a Washington Post bestselling book that's in second place yeah, behind maybe Michelle you've Obama. Done that, right? Maybe you've done what you've done. <laughs> maybe you've done what I've done. And then you're sitting on an airplane and you're like, wait a minute. You're like, I didn't realize that this is what 
success looked like. I didn't oh, know this was possible for me. I didn't know I'd make any list. But if I'd made that list, what if I could make another one? What if I could make a bigger one? And everybody says, if you can name it, you can tame it. Like, you know, and I was like, that's, that's bullshit. I don't want to tame it. I want to claim it. Like, I want to name it so I could claim it because I want to go after it because I am ambitious, right? I want the thing. I want to be the girl with the most cake. Like, I want everything. Like, you have this one short life. And if I don't give back my body to whatever created it at the end completely beats a shit, I have not done everything I can. Like, I want to live fully into this life. That is like, I want to suck the marrow out of all of it. Like, this is who I am. And so I'm sitting on that airplane and I'm like, you know, squashed in between these two guys who are snoring on my shoulders. And I'm like, I was on the way back from Vancouver, heading back home on this red eye. And I was like... I'm 1,200 miles from where I've been and 1,200 miles from where I'm going. And between the blur that was yesterday and the blur that will be tomorrow is the space I'm in right now. And the space I'm in right now is wonder hell. It's that moment where the burden of your potential walks in and is like, hey, Mark, what you got for me? Are you going to live into this newfound you? You didn't even know you had this potential yesterday. And suddenly you see it and you have a choice. It is amazing. It's exciting. It's humbling. It's wonderful to have succeeded in some way. And now the burden of potential hands you anxiety and stress and uncertainty. It's kind of hell. It's wonderful. And it's hell. It's wonder hell. But wonder hell is only available to people who can actually achieve it. Because if you didn't see that you did a thing that was good and it actually could be great, you wouldn't go after it. You wouldn't want it. And so you wouldn't know that there was a pathway and habits to form and steps to take in order to get there. So the bad news about Wonder Hell is that we're all in it all the time because every one of us is standing in between yesterday and tomorrow. The good news is you wouldn't even see Wonder Hell if you weren't worthy of your Wonder Hell. And so before we hit record, I was like, I think I might challenge you a little bit and stuff. So, you know, your book is upcoming yes. and it may answer this question, but working through your keynote, your TEDx keynote that has like over a million views and stuff, which, which is like, which is great. I was left going like, I feel like you haven't given me the answer, right? Like you've, we've identified that when we have this, I love the term, the burden of potential, because I've always said that, you know, that your, call, your passion, your purpose, your calling, your desire demands something of you. Like it yes. demands of you to get out of your comfort zone, to grow, to push yourself. Like like you just, it requires it of you. But, you know, so I'm totally on board with this idea that we're wonderstruck people who have to balance just the demand and how hellish yes. the requirements are of us. But what is the answer? Is it just like, like earlier when I said, like, I keep waiting for it to get easier. And the answer is like, it never gets easier. Right. I keep waiting for someone to do it. No one's going to do it. I right. keep waiting for it, success to get simpler. It never does. Like, is the answer just like, oh, by the way, like, this is awesome. And it's always going to be a bit hellish. It's always going to be a little bit of wonderlust. It's always going to be a little exciting. There's always going to be a little change. Like, let's stop wasting time thinking about it and overanalyzing it. Yes. And what should I do and all this stuff and just yes. go like, hey, by the way, this is what living is. You're doing it right now. Yeah, Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm happy this is sort of the last question here because I think it's a really important one, which is that on the other side of this wonder hell is just the next one and the next one and the next one. So like there is no getting out of it. There's just getting comfortable in it. And so the book is organized and these sort of organized around this idea of this amusement park. And there's three parts. There's imposter town, there's Doubtsville and Burnout City. And then each one of the parts actually has five rides those 15 rides represent the crazy tsunami of emotions that come at us. So it is really organized as a book for somebody to come in and be like, oh, the bumper cars, I need to quiet my perfectionist tendencies, the roller coaster, I need to deal with when everything is uncertain, the merry-go-round, maybe I want to say no to hustle porn and quiet things down now. So each of the chapters is a ride that tells stories of people who have been in those moments. And then there are actual, you know, things that we can do, tips and tricks and, and strategies to put into place to deal with that thing that's happening in your life right now. Um, I can't wait to get into it. So the book is coming out spring 2023. If you're listening to this or watching this after uh, April 2023, then you should order it and you can pre-order it now. Laura Gassner Odding, where should people connect with you? Yes. So my name is Laura Gassner Odding. All my good friends call me LGO. So you can find me on all the socials at Hey LGO, H-U-I-L-G-O and wonderhell.com is a great place to find out more about the book. 